Hey, Tony Topaz here. I'm getting ready to drop another issue of Topaz Online Video Mag. But before I do so, I had to make a little special announcement on this one because, you know, this next guest, I feel very close to because, you know, me and him kind of came out around the same time. You know, he was, he just released his first movie on VHS. Like, I still have VHS. He boxed them up himself. Guess what? I did the same thing. I just came in a little bit behind him. And, you know, um, it's been reached one teach one ever since. Uh, he's a, a, a well of information for filmmakers. So, pay close attention and make sure you give us support at dollarreview.com. And, oh, yes, he has a fundraiser. I have a fundraiser. Once again, he was just a little bit ahead. But you know what? We're going to do this together. So, Please show your support, enjoy the interview, and I shall see you on DollarReview.com. My name is Craig Ross Jr. and I'm a director, producer, writer. I went to uh, NYU Film for undergrad and I did a year at AFI for uh, out here for, um, for grad school. I'm from Boston originally. My first film, um, my first feature film was a film I did called Cappuccino, uh, which I did for about $12,000 and we sh actually shot it on film, which was crazy. Um, Super 16, it took me two and a half years to finish it, but uh, we finally did. I had to cut my own negative and everything. It was crazy. When I did my first film, Cappuccino, when it was time for distribution, I didn't know what to do, basically. So what I did was I put it on VHS myself. Um, you designed the cover, the box cover, and I put it on VHS myself. I, I, I got a minimum order of, I think, 200 copies, and I went to the Black Expo here in Los Angeles, and I started just selling them to whoever. And then I would just go around and sell them out of the trunk of my car. And a distributor actually bought one. A distributor in out of New Jersey called EI Cinema bought one. And they called me and said, you know, because my number was on the box. I made sure my number was on the box. And so they called me and they said, look, we can get this in a blockbuster for you. And at the time, you're looking at like, you know, mid 90s, mid to late 90s. And blockbuster was the, you know, the, that was it. That was the holy grail for, uh, for indie filmmakers like myself, especially micro budget filmmakers. Because you knew that blockbuster, if they were going to take it, they were going to take, you know, 15, 20, maybe 30,000 units. So that's what happened. They got in the blockbuster for me. They um, and I started this merry-go-round of of my independent film career. And it was actually pretty lucrative. I lived off that movie for the next two years. We got a new one here. We gonna twist up for you from the five foot giant and Mo J Smooth called Funk and Die, baby. Funk and Die. This is it. The one and only tribute to the 1973 blockbuster film Superfly, starring and directed by independent guerrilla filmmaker Tony Topaz. This clever, no-budget production is a gem of guerrilla filmmaking, proving imitation is indeed the greatest form of flattery. Tony Topaz's likeness to Ron O'Neill's Superfly is uncanny, although there are very reminiscent images that pay tribute to Ron O'Neill's performance. The tribute stops there. Blood Money has its very own unique story and style. This gorilla masterpiece is a must-see and is yours for a pledge of just $10. And for a pledge of $5, you can get the funky soundtrack. And for a pledge of $20, you can get the two-disc original director's cut entitled The Funky Fridays, packed with a ton of extras. Dollarpreview.com brings you the
the new Watermelon. Now you have a choice. Oscar Micheau style, baby. Here's something that's really going to blow your mind. You could get paid for watching movies for free. That's right, free! DollarPreview.com brings you the new blood of Hollywood. Now you have a choice. Oscar Micheau style, baby. Well, I mean, the distributor was a small indie distributor. So yeah, they're going to deal with, with individual filmmakers at the time. Um, because, I mean, because they, they were small too. You know, you know, there wasn't, we didn't have the iTunes yet or anything like that. So, you know, Netflix wasn't available. So this was just a small indie label out of New Jersey. And, you know, so they were just looking for new content. My next project was, was Blue Hill Avenue. Um, and Blue Hill was, was a completely different animal because it cost so much more money. We were now, you know, I was now in like the 1 1.6, 1, 1.7 million dollar range when I did Blue Hill, when I did Blue Hill Avenue. So we were in such a different range that now that was more like I started, I started uh, going around to major distributors and screening it for them. I mean, at that time, you know, now you're looking at like early 2000s, um, we were still on film. I mean, people, most people were still using film at that time so I was carrying two big film prints all around town going to you know to you know Warner Brothers Paramount everybody you know setting up meetings and and everywhere so it was crazy because <laughs> you don't have to do that today but then you had you know uh, if they wanted you wanted them to see your film the way it was intended to be seen which was on a big screen you I had to carry around two 35 millimeter um, tin cans basically but I would go up into the projection booth and meet with the projectionist and tell them what the specs were. And uh, we never really got a chance to, to test it, usually. But I'm also, I'm also on the board down at, you know, in all those uh, screening rooms, and all the screening rooms for, um, for all the studios, uh, they have like a, a, a tech board, basically, which is in the audience. So the director sits next to that, and you can you can um, you can ride the sound. You can change color. You can you know there's a lot of things you can do gradually as the film's moving, so that nobody really gets too jarred by it. Um, so that's what you know. That's what I usually did. Is I sat next to the tech board and I just is it kind of as it was going. Yeah, it's almost like a it's almost like a one line exactly. Mm, wow. Okay. Only you've got an audience. What? Okay, so and you've got an audience <laughs> watching. <laughs> Blue Hill got a small theatrical release. I believe it was only a few theaters, um, and it wasn't really promoted that well. You know, just a few newspapers. Um, again, this was just prior to the internet really exploding and doing all that. So, um, and uh, you know, uh, Lionsgate who picked it up, they. I think they were just really doing the the selected theater thing for you know as a promotion for the video. So, um, but I think it did very very well for them on video. You gotta understand this was years later that we got that deal. We shot the movie in two thousand. It was done in two thousand one. Two thousand one is when I'm shopping it to to everyone. The deal didn't happen until two thousand four. And so, wow. there was, it was, you know, I had already moved past that picture. I'd already done two more pictures, and um, I was just, I, I thought it was never going to see the light of day. And then, and then, uh, a contractor called me who the producers had hired, and they basically had gotten a deal with, uh, with Lionsgate. Well, there was there were several problems, really. Um, uh, one was the producers. The producers had really they had no intention of putting it out, and so they did everything that they could to block the sales. 
of the picture. And so, without getting into too much detail, um, the picture was supposed to never see the light of day. And so, but then what happened was there was a certain entity that came along that said, you have to, to the producers and said, you are going to have to show that you at least try to make a profit on this movie. And only then did we get the deal with Lionsgate. Basically, the producers had decided, it was, I think before we ever shot it, they had decided that it wasn't going to ever see the light of day. Okay, so this is one of those tax shelter kind of deals. Exactly. That they don't, tell, you know, obviously they didn't tell me that, so I'm going all, right, right. I'm going all around town, but I don't own the picture at that point. Right. They own it. Right. So every time I set up a deal, they, they vetoed it. Right, so, okay, so I get it. So you're, you're, this, you're this hungry filmmaker, they take advantage of it, and basically they don't let you know that you're a dead man walking. Exactly. So I'm walking all over town, setting up deals. I mean, we, we set up some very, very nice deals. Uh, and every time I left again, but, you know, I, I, I would leave the room because I didn't own the picture. And so wow. when it, you know, when it came time for them to meet and they met with whoever, they just turned down everything. Everything, they turned it all down. And I was like, why are you turning this down? I mean, this is a great deal. Uh-huh. And they would just say, oh, it's just not right for us. Wow. So how long did it take for you to figure out what was going on? When I got the Lion, when Lionsgate, when we got the Lionsgate deal. That's when I figured it out. Oh, okay. So then you finally got to be the inside man and see what was really going down. Yeah, because I kept asking him. And they wouldn't, they would, you know, it was just, over the years, it was just like, blah, 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 you know, they really would not give me a straight answer. Hello, my name is Tony Topaz, and first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for coming to DollarReview.com. And I am doing a fundraising project, yes, but most importantly, what I want you to do is join the mailing list. You see, DollarReview.com is more than just a website that I thought about two or three days ago. It's a mission that I've been working on for a long time, and it is finally crystallizing. But I need your subscribership. I need viewers for the films that I'm gathering together. There are so many independent filmmakers who have great works. They just need some eyes to check them out. So please do us that favor and sign up to be on our mail list. Now, don't misunderstand Dollar Per View. Okay, a lot of people think that they have to pay a dollar to see a movie, and that is very incorrect. Okay, you only pay a dollar to watch a movie if you choose so, do it without a commercial. But if you watch a sponsored review, well then you watch, not only do you watch the movie for free, but you also get paid to watch the movie. DollarPreview.com brings you the new blood of Hollywood. Now you have a choice. Oscar a show style, baby. Uh, I got into TV because uh, my manager at the time had given Blue Hill Avenue to one of his contacts over at Sony TV. They then, they liked Blue Hill enough for, to make a call to uh, an, a producer-director on a show called Strong Medicine. And he liked it and then invited me to come shadow him. And so I did. And then uh, after I shadowed him, they offered me an episode. Yeah, shadow him means that I would come watch him on the set and see how things were done on on that set. Now, this was a two and a half year process. It didn't, you know, it wasn't like a few weeks. This was like a two and a half year process. I don't mean the shadowing was a two and a half year process. I mean the whole thing. From the time that Sony TV actually got the, the first, you know, their first copy of Blue Hill Avenue to the time I was actually on set directing a Sony TV show was two and a half years. Oh, just as long as an episode took. So eight days, nine days. You can get um, representation um, easier when you're already working or when you're already got something that's coming out. So that's what happened. I had done uh, a movie called Ride or Die, 
with Dwayne Martin, and um, Sony was just about to buy it. They were considering buying it, and so it was much easier at that time just you know to call up a few managers and go, look, you know, hey, I got a, I got a picture that Sony's about to buy. And then they would call and verify, and Sony would say, oh, yeah, we're about to buy that picture. So then all of a sudden, you become a property that they want to be in business with. Uh, I mean, for me, the playing field is, is a lot different. I mean, it's, it's um, the climate has become quite, quite different in Hollywood. Um, first of all, now Hollywood's really only pick up, picking up things that have a brand. Um, the really i mean that's really the way it's it's kind of moving now and a brand means that you've got followers you've got you've picked up momentum somewhere that wasn't always the case they, there was a time when they would pick up stuff just you know just because they thought it was cool but that's that no longer exists um hollywood is now making far less movies too and on the movies they are making are all blockbusters they're all really big movies hollywood doesn't see below below say 60 million dollars um, the movies that you see that are below that are usually acquisitions by Hollywood. They didn't; they weren't created by Hollywood. They were created by smaller production companies with output deals. So the production company raises its own money to make the $20 million, $15 million, $10 million movie and then uses its output deal through a studio to actually get the movie, you know, exploited. But... Uh, um, but so um, the climate has definitely, definitely changed completely, with the, with, you know, with the, with the internet, with um, digital filmmaking. Um, now, uh, it, you can now actually create a, a project for far less than what you could create it for even three years ago. Um, with with move with uh, things like Kickstarter and and. and, and uh, being able to directly uh, sell to your audience via VOD, uh, all of the social media. I mean, basically, no one's quite done it yet, but filmmaking at this point is almost a turnkey business. Once you start, you know, once you start um, being able to make movies for far less. Uh, raising capital online that's that's non-recourse, which means you don't have to pay it back through crowdfunding, and then going direct to to the audience. I mean, it's 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 only a matter of time before you start seeing studios online from individuals, um, because they will have built up their following. They will have you know. Um, now it's going to be a slow process, but that day is coming. Movie Snack Packs! Everything you'll need whilst you watch a movie is in this commemorative VHS sleeve. Popcorn, candy, drink mix, and two special surprises. Movie Snack Packs! Gift for the pledge of $350. Hi, this is Tasha Douglas, and if you want to see what you've never seen before, go to DollarPreview.com. DollarPreview.com brings you the new blood of Hollywood. Now you have a choice. Oscar Michelle style, baby. What happened with Mansfield was the same thing that happened on Blue Hill Avenue, but we still got a deal on Blue Hill. Mansfield got bootlegged really really badly before it ever came out that killed its dvd killed it now at the time mansfield you know now we're like around 2007 and that completely killed the dvd um which was which was going to be a very you know good source of income for us it was the last hurrah at that time before the dvd market sort of went kaput so um but during the time that the bootleg happened and we couldn't get a deal, the DVD market fell out. So I shot, I shot Mansfield in 2006. By 2007, it was completely bootlegged all over the country. Um, I got a deal finally with BET in 2009. Um, 
for broadcast, which you know, which uh, took care of the the budget, but there wasn't much profit because I couldn't get I couldn't get the film. I couldn't get it uh, sold once it got bootlegged. But the whole bootleg thing for Mansfield 12, I, I really don't know how it happened. It Somehow it got leaked. And, um, I mean, I don't want to point any fingers or anything like that, but uh, when, you're do, when you're doing a low-budget indie, you know, you really have to deal with... Um, you can't deal with very big companies. You have to deal with really small companies. And somewhere along the line, you know, in my opinion, it got backdoored. You know, somebody put it on, you know, made a copy and, and you know, started selling it out of the back door. Uh, it got to the point where I, I went down to, to Chinatown because I knew that that's where all the bootlegs came from. And I started to try to follow the process backwards. But I only got as far as a a small shop in, in in Chinatown, and what they were doing was they were actually they had actually created their own master and was and were and was uh, creating copies from that, um, and they had created their own DVD cup. And wow. Now, this was only one shop in one city. I mean, it was all over the country. Um, I was getting hit up all the time saying, wow, I saw your movie. It was great. I'm like, how did you see my movie? Oh, I bought it. I bought it. You know, the guy came into the salon and I bought it. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> I mean, what can you, what, you know, what can, what can you do? I mean, I was, the, I'm the production company on it. What was, I mean, uh, who was I going to sue? I mean, what was... I mean, you can only sue for what it is that you, what it is the movie would have been worth, and that was never determined. And now, if I had, if I had had a deal worth say a million dollars, and that went kaput, and I could actually point the finger at one person, then maybe I could have, you know, I could have done something to try to, but we didn't have that. You know, this happened long before we, we, you know, it, this happened, you know. Uh, prior to the film actually being completely finished. So what they got was a stereo mix, you know, which was a rough cut stereo mix. We had done a 5.1, you know, uh, Dolby mix. That wasn't on the bootleg, though. So it was prior to our actually finishing the picture. And it was prior to our color, co prior to our color correction as well. So... It, it it was it just became a nightmare. I mean, it was it was kind of uh, it was pretty bad. I mean, it was, now that it happened to me twice, and I was like, oh, wow, all right, two times in a row, this has happened. Um, so now I'm you know with this next film, I'm going to be very 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 careful. I mean, it's a lot it's it's a lot easier now to really. Because now I have very, very close friends in post-production that, uh, that I trust immensely. And then there's also, uh, now everything's done through a file as well. So it's much easier to keep track. So it, not to say that it can't happen. It could happen. But I think this time I have a much, you know, much better much better ways of, of ensuring that it doesn't. Okay, kick it off again. DollarPreview.com brings you the new blood of Hollywood. Now you have a choice. Oscar Michaud style, baby.